latest episode of the Talking Balls podcast. The, the weekly snooker podcast comes out every Wednesday. I'm your host, Michael Wright, writer 74, and I'll hand you over to my co-host. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Really looking forward to this chat today. Should be a lot of fun. And normally, normally you lead in with the name, but I tell you what, we're going to let him introduce himself. Well, I was thinking of some cool ways of introducing him, but I, I, I don't think I could do it justice. And if I try and wrap it, it'll be a disaster. So um, we're going to let Peter say who he is and introduce himself. So p who's the Peter we've got in today? Well, first of all, I didn't know you were Scottish, Lee, but I've discovered that now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a nobody. I have nothing to be introduced. I'm just little old Pete. <laughs> no, I'm Peter Devlin. I'm a snooker player. Uh, and I'm also somewhat of a rapper. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I, do, I do bits and bobs. I'm a jack of all trades at the moment. But yeah, uh, I'm on the World Snooker Tour. And uh, I'm from London. Thanks, Peter. We normally do that bit. But I think we, what we've talked about when we were preparing for seeing you and meeting you today was that there's an awful lot on the table to talk about. But there's actually quite a lot off the table that you seem really active with as well. So it's it's a good chance for us to, you know, one of the best things about this is that we get to know the person behind the, the social media, the person behind the, you know, the WST profile or whatever uh, and see the guy behind. So it's uh, so thanks for joining us and, and spending some time with us, really. Welcome, pleasure to be on. <laughs> so, so just tell us then, Peter. Just um, obviously, we're just finishing. The time we record this is the day after the final of the English Open that uh, that Neil Robertson won in the end. Um, a tough battle with John Higgins. Um, how do you reflect on your season so far? We're a few months in, and we've got we've got crowds back again. Very different to last year. How do you reflect on how things are going so far? Um, it's it was a good start and it's been a bad middle. It's, it's almost been identical to last season. I had a good start and then a bad middle. And it's always Zhu Yu Long that causes it because <laughs> it's all going well. Then I play him and then it just goes wrong. Um, it's It's been different. It's not been the improvement I was hoping in terms of quantity of tournaments because there's still mm. not that many events. Um, the qualification events, not a fan of mm. because... Mm players down the rankings like me we could really use with momentum yeah. and last season momentum was a big thing I, I won my first match in the European Masters mm. and I'd go and play Mark Williams the next day having just won 3,000 which for my first ever event was amazing yeah and a good win and so I've then played Williams and I, I'm settled a lot easier I'm you know I'm mm. feeling confident and I've won the match mm. and then continued that and got to the last 16 whereas now you, you're winning a match and then going home again, yeah. which is great because you get to go home having not lost, which is very unusual. Usually the only the winner of the tournament goes home having mm. not lost. Yeah. But it's, and then you're playing round two, two months later, which mm. is pretty much another tournament. Even if it was two weeks later, it still feels like a brand new tournament. Yeah. So I've had two good wins against Erson Backer and Matthew Stevens mm. in the two home nations events I qualified for. And, uh, I carried a bit of confidence through for that. And then two months later, when I get to round two of them, it's like, where's a well, brand, brand new event again? And yeah. I've lost the, the first, effectively, this, the first round again. Um, so, not a fan of the format in that way. It, it does make it difficult because someone like me will need momentum because, mm. you know, um, it's pretty tricky down the rankings when you're constantly drawing higher ranked players. It's, it's mm. not easy. So, momentum is an important thing and carrying confidence is an important thing. And it comes and goes very quickly. Mm. Um, similarly to last season, I've drawn Zhu Yu Long, who's been superb. Um, can't stand him now. He's doing my head. He's very, very good. <laughs> very good. Um, and then from then, I've just had some very tricky draws. You know, I've, coincidentally, I've just been having draws that have been playing very well. So first I had Mark Allen, who just made a 147 the day before he played me. Then I played him. It was a good match. It was. It, mm. I, could, I should have won it. I was. I played better. Um, just early nerves. First mm. time playing on telly um, cost me. But other, other than that, played really well and uh, enjoyed the experience. Yeah. But that was that was that. Then I've had Hossein Bafai in the mm. first round of the German. He's just beat Ronnie five nil. Yeah. And I knew it was going to happen as well. Like I thought, I'm playing Hossein, Hossein in about four days. Mm. He's now got Ronnie. He's guaranteed to beat him and carry a load of confidence going through to when he plays me. And he beat Ronnie 5-0. Uh, 
and, uh, and then he gets to me and, and plays very well as well, beats me. Mm. And then Tepshire and New uh, in the European Masters, or no, what was that? That was in the English Open, uh, who just had a 147 about four days before <laughs> that in his qualifier. So, you know, I've got players who I can beat, but they're on good form. And I wasn't, you know, I was very cold, very rusty, very low on confidence, purely because I've had defeat after defeat in mm. the last few weeks. Mm. And they're high on confidence. And it's very hard to overturn, um, to overturn that, you know, just coming in cold into an event. So it's been tricky and uh, confidence does does come and go very, very fast. Yeah. At the moment, it's on the floor mm. um, because I've had a few consecutive defeats, especially now looking at the calendar, very empty, very, mm. very empty. But the UK's, which is great, the most important event of the season, mm. apart from the world's. Well, they're both equally important just because of how the money's distributed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you could get to a last 16, you can get to a semi-final of a, of, of a tournament like Gibraltar and still not win as much as the first round in the UK. Mm -hmm. Those six score players are going to win more money than you and you've had a core or a semi. So, yeah, huge event. Um, one I've got to do well in. But then after that, it's pretty much empty for two months. Mm. And then you've got the shootout, the Welsh Open, the Gibraltar Open and the Worlds pretty much. So it just feels like very, very empty. Mm. I know that I, this is my second year. And I'm sort of nearly halfway through the second year, but it genuinely doesn't feel like I've even had a year yet. It feels like it's been half, like three quarters of one year. Mm. It just doesn't feel like I've done that much um, in terms of tournaments. Yeah, I've had some great experiences, had some good wins, had some bad losses, but it doesn't feel like I've had a season. It's mm. just doesn't, it just hasn't been that much. There's been a lot of qualifiers behind closed doors. There's been a lot of Milton Keynes stuff mm. Mm. and a lack of obviously the Chinese events and the Saudi Arabian, the Indian and mm. so many events. So yeah, it just doesn't feel like I've had a full two seasons, which I'm sure a lot of people who turn pro at the same time as me will relate to. Yeah. But nothing you can do about it. I do, I do like to think that although it's a, a really rubbish time to turn pro, it was also the best time to turn pro because the amateur circuit at that time was completely non-existent. Mm. There was no tournaments. There was nothing you weren't even allowed to go and practice in the club because of COVID. Mm. So if I didn't turn pro at the time I did, I would literally have nothing to do. Yeah. And I would have to try and discover how I'm going to make any money because it mm. was that, it, there was nothing I could do. Even, I even struggled to practice as a pro in lockdown. Mm. So yeah, it was, it was the best time to turn pro because of that. And it was also the worst time to turn pro because of um, how it was. So yeah, getting crowds back is great. Um, I've been quite excited to you know offer people tickets to come and watch mm. because mm. I've always promised people you know from a young age when you say oh if I ever make it I'll sort you out tickets yeah. uh, I always stick, I stick to those promises so anyone that I felt like had actually been on my side and supported me mm. I had them down to watch I had about 10 11 people come to Northern Ireland which was great oh great about 16 people come to the English Open so I had a lot of support mm. um but it is still new you know I've played in front of mm. a few crowds now but not anywhere near as many as I would have expected at this mm, point. Mm. I thought there'd be a lot more. Yeah. And uh, it's still new and it still takes a bit in getting used to and experience is everything in this mm. sport. And I think that just goes to show why the top players are still up there at yeah. the, whatever age they are because it, you know, it's, it's not about youth at all. Everyone mm. says, oh, the young players aren't coming through, there's something wrong or the old players are dominating and that's a bad thing. It's not. It's just purely the older you get, the better you get. And that's mm. just the way it is. It's an experience game. And uh, there's no shame in having older players doing well because mm -hmm. they're, the more you've played and the more experiences you've had, the better you are. So, you know, you can't just expect young players to appear and blow them away because that just isn't going to happen. And mm -hmm. it's not like tennis or football where young young people are advantaged. They're not, they're mm -hmm. disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, experience is everything. Haven't had that many experiences, but um, got to keep going. Like I said, confidence is on the floor at the moment, but it'll only take... Mm -hmm. 10 minutes of good form to trigger something good and then I'll start playing better and then it'll all get better again. So I'm aware that it's not something to get too down about because it can mm. change every time. And Peter, uh, you, you spoke about the crowds, uh, how you've not played in front of too many crowds at the moment, but you strike me as someone that will be really looking forward to playing in front of the crowds and that, that's something that you'll feed off, I think. Yeah, it's what I, it's what I dreamed of. At, you know, as soon as I turned pro, I thought, you know, after one or two events, it will become a normal thing again but it wasn't but yeah no that's what I want I mean it does add extra pressure it adds a bit of nerves um 
it certainly made me a little bit more nervous at the start mm. of matches but that's to be expected because it's new mm. but once I actually do settle like for example the Mark Allen match knowing that you're live on telly knowing that everyone in the arena is watching you mm. and when you're playing well because I was playing very well towards the end of that match I felt very much in control of the game I was very confident didn't feel like missing no mm. better feeling than that you know you feel invincible yes. when everyone's watching you great feeling and uh, and I would if I'd won that match, you know, I'd have been able to engage with the crowd. It would be brilliant. Mm. Mm. So I thought, you know, that's that's what you play for. It's it's the attention. And uh, but yeah, of course, it is it is nerve wracking as well. So it's a strange one. It's it's something that annoys me as well because I've you know I've, I've played in front of small crowds and you know you feel the nerves about it because mm. naturally you know. But I've rapped in front of thousands of people and I've not felt one bit of nerves. <laughs> um, yeah. Why that is, not 100% sure, but, mm. you know, when I've done, when I have wrapped in front of thousands of people, just like, there's no, there's no part of me that thinks it's going to go wrong. I know it's going to yeah. be fine. I know I'm going to yeah. smash it. No problem. I wrapped yeah. live on Eurosport. In front of <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of people, <laughs> yeah. And I made it up on the spot. <laughs> you know, we weren't prepared. Yeah. But, <laughs> but no nerves. I just knew mm. I was going to be fine. But then you put a snooker cue in my hand in front of Bob and his dog, and then <laughs> it's a different story. You get nervous, so it is. It is bizarre. Mm. I think it's because it means more, you know, because it is your, it is what, you know, it's, it's what your heart wants rather mm. than just doing a bit of fun on the side. Plus, the rapping's never gone wrong. The rapping, yeah. I've never really messed anything up badly or embarrassed myself when I'm rapping, apart mm. from when I'm doing it on purpose, taking a piss out myself and whatever. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, it's the knockbacks that give you those doubts. So because you have more knockbacks than mm. steps forward in snooker, you know, you're always going to lose more than you win. Um, that's what gives you them doubts and them, you know, jitters. Whereas in rapping, mm. for example, uh, I've never had anything go wrong, so I've got no reason to doubt or be nervous or anything like that. Mm. Yeah, so, no uh, scars. No scars, exactly. So that's probably, that's probably why there's a difference between performing on a rapping way and a performing on a snooker way. But that being said, I'm looking forward to getting more experiences like that because that's what it's all about, just having as many as you can. So mm. bring on the next one. Hopefully hopefully by next year, even the qualifiers will have crowds. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's no mm. need for the Iron Coast doors qualifiers. It doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah, that, that's something we've talked about, Lee, isn't it? You know, obviously often the qualifiers, or most of the time the qualifiers are at a different location to the main tournament yeah. as well. So again, that bit about the the break between qualifying and the main tournament, it's not only the time, is it? It's also the fact it's going to be on different tables, going to be different location, different feel to it all. I mean, you, you, you're not, you're still not really prepared for when you go into the main tournament. And, and one of the things I remember this, I think it was the Joe Perry episode that we did. And he was saying that for some players, once they play against a top player in the first round, they almost feel like they've made it, you know, Oh, here I am. I'm, I'm up against such and such. Um, and he was arguing that that can be a problem in a way for development because, and, and not in the same way you said it, but there is something, isn't there, about if you're trying to make your way and you hit a top player in your first game, you're not getting you're not getting deep into the tournament. You're not getting a few rounds in where you're finding your feet and then you're ready to step up. You're almost snuffed out before you've had a real chance to show what you can do. Um, you know, if you think of the FA Cup in football, I don't I don't know. Are you a football fan? Yeah. yeah. Who's your team? Leighton Orient. Leighton Orient. Uh, that was on the on the tip of my tongue, to be honest. Um, so Leighton Orient. So, uh, well, they had the Barry Hearn connection. And, um, you know, there's something there, isn't there, about in the FA Cup, you almost, the first two rounds you're playing as the lower division sides. And then the third round, they're dangling that in front of you. You get to the third round, you can play a Premier League side. Whereas this is really different, isn't it? I mean, the, you know, Ronnie's almost on record saying, well, I'm not sure if I'm playing any more qualifiers and this and that. And you just think it's so hard for you guys to break through and and make your name, really. Although a lot of these tournaments early in the season have been very kind of short. And, and maybe you know, maybe there's players who are making more headway because of the length of the tournaments as well. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people will have will know about the debate between flat draw and tiered draw. Mm. As a, you know, everyone will have their opinions. My opinions are very divided I think there's definitely good points for each I think in terms of bringing people through or bringing younger players through mm. the tiered draw is a lot better mm. if you've got to play someone of your own ranking in the first round 
and then you win that match and then you get a little bit of confidence and momentum mm-hmm. and then you play someone a bit higher and a bit higher you're, you're, you're developing you're learning you're playing mm-hmm. more matches you're you're having a lot more closer matches and overall you've got more chance of building confidence and developing as a player through that so yeah. i do think in terms of quality of players and growth of players the tiered system is better however that the flat draw system is the glitz and the glam the flat draw system gives you the opportunity to have experiences that you might not have in the tiered draw system mm. Mm. if you draw ronnie in the first round of a tournament you're going to play on telly you're going to have all the crowd and you've mm. got that small chance of winning and becoming extremely famous and having an amazing experience and that could kickstart you mm. into doing something else yeah also with the flat draw system there's better money because you're getting three thousand for the first round match whereas in the tiered system it was like 500 quid for the first round and then another 500 quid to make it a thousand after round two and then maybe two thousand for round three so you were having to do three four times the work Mm. um for for the same money and i think in my position what would i have more 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 chance of doing winning a best of nine against touch i renew or winning four best of nines against lower players but but still good quality players mm. uh, to win the same money. I'd rather have a best of nine with Tech Iron New because I've got yeah. more chance of winning one match against one good player than mm. winning four matches against four just below but still good players. Mm. So um, I prefer the flat draw because it's mm. giving me opportunities to get what I want. I've played on telly, I've played top 16 players, I've beaten top 16 players, mm. Mm. and I've won brilliant money. Good. Not brilliant money, but you know, it's not a wage. It's I'm 79 yeah. from the world. It's not a wage, but it's uh, it, you know, it's compared to what I had before I turned pro, mm. it's great money, mm. and um, it's given me those opportunities. Whereas put me in a flat in a tiered draw system, and uh, I wouldn't be getting that opportunity to make yeah. that sort of money. I'd be winning hundreds here, hundreds there. I'd be playing in more backstage cubicles because they're going to want if it's, mm. if it's a tiered mm. draw system, they're going to have a lot more qualifiers because they don't want. Yeah all that happening at the venue yeah so i'd never get to a venue you know unless mm. i'd won four matches which would be pretty rubbish um so i think there is a basically to summarize that argument i'd say this the, the tiered draw system of playing one match after the other against people of a similar level is a better system for bringing talent through mm. and generally mm. getting younger players to compete better but I prefer the flat draw because it gives you opportunities and it gives you a chance to really enjoy it, live the dream. And, Mm. you know, Mm. if you're good enough, you'll get through either of them. Yeah. That's just the way it is. You know, you can get terrible draws, but you know, if you are good enough, Mm. you'll find a way through, which some players have done in the, in the flat draw system. So, yeah, I think, I think the the tier draw is better, but yeah, Mm. it's, it's the opportunities in the flat draw that I much prefer. And I think that they overall, for me, give me better opportunities and I'm enjoying it more because of it, because some of the experiences I've had, they wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for that random draw. Yeah, I guess it gives you a taste as well, doesn't it? It gives you a taste of what awaits if you do kind of move up to that next level. I mean, we had kind of last week with the English, didn't we, with Jamie DeVille kind of getting a chance to, um, got a lot of credit for how well he went in the tournament and 17-year-old, you know, he probably wouldn't have got that opportunity in, in a different qualifying system yeah exactly um, but in a way he kind of it was kind of similar for him because he was supposed to play mark williams in the first round mm, mm. which you know he may well have beaten him but most likely you know as a brand new player playing against mark williams it's not yeah. gonna happen for you. yeah but by then getting replaced by mark lloyd his first round match was effectively someone of his own level mm, mm. by winning that he's then got a little bit of confidence takes it through to one of the lower ranked chinese players mm. so effectively one step up or maybe two steps up but still a few steps up yeah beats them gets a little bit more confidence then takes on Zhao Zingtong who's one of the higher ranked Chinese players so effectively his draw was a tiered a tiered draw mm. but that mm. can happen in the flat draw because it's you know anything can happen the draw goes any way yeah um but that was a good he's a good example of how the tiered system would work because he did play someone who mm. was on his level an amateur as well then he played someone lower ranked then he played someone higher ranked yeah, and yeah. ended up losing to mark king mm. um so that that's a, that's an example of how the tiered system would work because if you played mark king first round unlikely to have the same outcome mm. Mm. Um, yeah. 
so yeah so that it is great but again because it's a flat draw it's given him that opportunity to get to a last 16 of a ranking event mm. whereas in a tiered system three matches would have got him to the last 48 which would probably mm. be worth about 1500 to 2000 so it kind of supports your argument really doesn't it in a sense that it might be tougher but it, it gives you a better chance of you know we've done about well maybe glory but that chance to be on the higher stage and to develop your career get the confidence up get in front of people all the good stuff you want to do really isn't it if you if yeah you're ambitious. Absolutely. absolutely it's a great it's an experience that he'll take a lot of confidence from mm. I, I mean as a player you know that you know it probably won't make no difference in the end you know he'll go to a he'll go to a, a tournament maybe in a week or two's time and maybe lose first round because that's how mm. the game is mm. So he'll take confidence from it and have a lot of self-belief from it. But then obviously, because at the moment, those experiences aren't going to come up all the time. Mm. You know, you'll naturally come back down again. Then it's about working to get back up again. So it's it's one of them. It's, it's one of them opportunities that it provides you that you don't get in the other system. And of course, but, in the flat draw, Peter, do you think that obviously you could bump into O'Sullivan first round? It used to be tough to get to maybe the quarterfinals or last 16 to bump into one of the big names, do you think there's less fear factor playing the big names because you're bumping into them all the time in the draws? Yeah, definitely. I think there's, there is going to be less because you're used to it. Once you've had a few wins, you'll fear it you know, less and less. But yeah, absolutely. You know, when you're playing lower-ranked players and constantly you know, qualifying on the odd occasion for events, you, know, you might qualify for two or three events in a season. And then you'll draw one of the top players at the main venue and you're effectively starting in round one again because now you're in round one of the main event playing a top player on conditions that they're used to in main venues of crowds. Yeah. It was like, it's like you're building up to play somebody and then, uh, it, and then you're scared. You might be confident because you're playing well, but it's a brand new venue, brand new arena. It's, it's all new to you, but yeah, the more that you're playing them, the, the less fear factor it can, it can have. And I think a few other sports, you've noticed the same thing. Like, I know tennis is always flat draw, but it might not be because of the draw, but with tennis, you can see that Serena's lost a little bit of fear factor. The girls are starting to beat her a lot more mm -hmm. in finals and stuff. In the darts, Van Gerwen is getting beaten a lot more than he ever used to. Mm -hmm. I think I think attitudes have changed towards playing him now. They're not as terrified anymore because that is a massive thing, the mental mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think the more the more that the, obviously the top players are in snooker are still dominating the game. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not a case of that it's making that much difference, but it's making a little difference to the odd wins here and there. Mm -hmm. But overall, the, the top players are still dominating in whatever format, and I think that's very commendable because. Yeah, you always think surely they can't keep doing it, but they do. So, mm -hmm. yeah, very, very, very impressive. Whatever the system, whatever the format, whether it's behind closed doors or mm -hmm. or with crowds, whatever the format, the top players are still doing what they do. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? Because because it could have been a bit of a level, or couldn't it? Not having the crowds last season, we might have expected a few more shocks because, well, you know that that bit is out. You haven't got the whole pressure of that. You still got the TV, but it's it's very different, isn't it? But it, we didn't get many, did we? And but even then, I mean, Lee Walker yeah. came on the other week and said that he felt that the standard of um, players now is higher than it's been before. And we ran a poll on it, and the people who did kind of you know vote did say the same. I mean, it was about seventy five, twenty five percent. Um, and said it was stronger and there's been some rumblings on from that one but it still was overwhelming that people thought the standard was better now and we're seeing people aren't we I mean Jordan Brown almost came out of nowhere to win last season beating Ronnie in the final and yeah it was um, crazy and there was yeah. also Yan Bing Tao winning the Masters I mean mm. there's, yeah. there is arguments about would that have happened if there was a crowd there um, and it's impossible to say and I wouldn't want to take mm. anything away from anyone winning the Masters um, but I do think behind closed doors definitely helped mm. because the atmosphere mm. in the Masters is going to be, you know, electric. And that, you know, that's going to add something. That's going to add a little yeah. bit of tension, a little bit of nerves, a little bit of adrenaline. Yeah. But it's impossible to predict because I could say the same thing. I beat Mark Williams behind closed doors. Mm. Would I have beaten him with a crowd? Maybe not. You know, mm. maybe I needed that little bit, little bit of a little, little bit of a less pressurised environment or, you know, a little bit less adrenaline. Mm. whatever it could be so yeah it does make a difference i think um but you can't 
see what would have happened. You know, you can't turn back time. So, um, you know, it, it, whatever happened, happened. <laughs> just, just to say about that match against uh, Mark, Peter, um, I, I think Mark was, uh, you were 4-1 up, am I right in saying yeah. that? And Mark brought it back to 4 all, and you closed out the decider with 102. So, I mean, that, that's pretty special. That must have gave you huge confidence going forward in that event. Yeah, it was an amazing result. I was really, really excited about it. It's a shame that we're still talking about it now and that there's not been any results of a similar <laughs> yeah. nature since. But, um, no, I'm glad I, I'm glad that I won 5-4 and not 5-1 because it, it sounds better, you know, wouldn't make it a century in the decider, um, especially yeah. when you've had a lead thrown away. Um, I wasn't even that bad, you know, at 4-1 up. He, he started to play better. And then at 4-3, I've had a good 50-odd break and uh, just had an unlucky cannon, not landed on a ball, not finished it off, and he cleared up. Mm. But I, uh, at 4-3, as I was making that 50-odd break, the adrenaline was really pumping because I could see that this was my winning chance. Mm. So, you know, all the little wobbles were happening. And yeah. then when I, didn't get that, when I didn't finish it off and then he dished up, I was sitting in my chair just shaking, like, because of that buzz of the adrenaline. Like, mm. But it was mm. wasted because it didn't finish the match. So that means that, you know, I wanted to celebrate and be happy and yeah. talk to people and just be excited, but I didn't get that chance. Mm -hmm. So now I'm sitting in my chair, not settled and feeling like I've got no chance in the decider. And then I played a bad safety shot first shot because I couldn't, I couldn't really move. I couldn't stand. I couldn't do anything. Mm. I was still buzzing from the frame before. So the important thing for me was just that it went a bit scrappy at the start. I played a lot of safety shots and that gave me a bit of extra time just to re-calm myself down mm. again. Because mm. um, yeah. if it went, if it went, if I got a chance in the ball straight away, it would have been too twitchy. I was, I wasn't ready for it. Mm. But after about five minutes of playing a few safeties, I got the long red, and then I was a lot calmer. I was like back to, back to a calm, composed state again. And yeah, they just, it, I took them really well, and uh, yeah, I was buzzing afterwards. You know, it wasn't so much the. The, it was mainly the, the, the stature of the victory because the money was mm. only a thousand pounds for that match. It wasn't like yeah. it was going to do anything at the rankings. It was just a great victory, a great mm. buzz, especially with it being my first major event, my first pro event. Yeah, massive. Um, mm. You know, I was, probably a lot of people were thinking, oh, he's just turned pro and he's already ready for it. Good on him. He's, <laughs> just, he was, I always knew he was ready for the pro tour. And I was like, no, it's not going to be like this all the time. But um, it, also, it also proves a little bit to yourself as well that that you can mix it with the big boys and you can produce some great snooker when it counts. Yeah, I did always, I always believed that the way my game was and the, st the style of play suits the pro conditions better. Mm. Because the amateur conditions, I don't like to whack the balls. I like to hit the ball soft. I like the tables. Yeah. And, um, and I like to think I've got a good solid all round game. Mm. So I felt like if I did turn pro, I would be able to compete well. It was just a case of getting on the tour in the first place because that's one of the hardest things. Um, and at the start of the season last year, I was like, it was confirming to me that, you know, I am suited for this and mm -hmm. this, you know, this is um, the level I'm at. But of course, I was always preparing for the moment where you get a few bad draws and you lose a few mm -hmm. games and you lose your confidence and then you feel like you can't beat anybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what the game does to you. It's torturous. So, it was, yeah, it, it was... It, I have... Uh, the confidence comes and goes. Ultimately, I know it's still there. I know the game's still there and the game that got me onto the tour is still there. Mm. But uh, it, it, the, the start of the season didn't last the way I'd hoped. Um, and obviously people who thought, oh, he's just turned up and starts winning matches. <laughs> Not going to carry on like that. I think, I think it was, I don't know if it was a record or anything. I don't think it was a record, but it was certainly unusual because I think me and Aaron Hill both did it. Get mm. to a last 16 of our first ever pro event which I don't think is oh my, Paul Deville's done it now <laughs> yeah but, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah not not common you know getting to a lot usually you're going to lose mm. you round, you know you're not going to do very well in your first few events because it's new to you um, so that was that was a nice little way to start but yeah it goes it goes up and down down patches that's where we're at now hopefully we'll get out dig out of it well, we'll link to what you said, really. I mean, a couple of the people on Twitter, when we told them we're recording with you, know, they, they asked some questions. And there's two that are kind of linked to this question about the confidence. So, um, and I'll do my best with the name. So apologies if it's not quite right. But I've got Herman R. Dallin, who's asked, what's his life philosophy? He seems to have a very positive attitude. 
And it's linked to another one. So I'm going to ask you two in one, if you don't mind. The other one was from uh, Lula Vichka. I'm curious as to what his opinion on mental coaching is and if he has a mental coach himself. So there's something there around your own life philosophy and you come across very positive, um, but also about the mental side of the game and whether that's something you get any assistance with. Um, I don't really have a life philosophy, but a lot of the time the positivity is external, not internal. Mm, mm. Everybody doubts themselves. Everybody has issues. Some people choose not to say anything and pretend that everything's okay. Yeah. Uh, some people genuinely don't have issues, but that's not often. And some people talk about them. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say that I'm amazingly positive. You know, I, I'm reasonably measured and balanced. Mm. But um, there's always issues going on. There's always doubts or whatever. And... Uh, you know, I, I sometimes talk about them, mm -hmm. but ultimately, you know, things like social media, you, as, as is always the case, you just talk about the good things, you know, you make yourself mm -hmm. look good because social media lies. Yeah. You know, I'll post nice things about what's going on on social media because I've got sponsors who, you know, obviously want to be associated with someone who's doing well. So you've got mm -hmm. to do the right thing for your, your brand. Yeah. But um, I'm not going to, you know, post... I've just been smashed 4-0 or 5-0 and that I'm feeling awful about myself yeah. because, you know, that might be the truth, but then you're going to get a lot of concerned people giving you support, which is mm. lovely, but it doesn't make you look professional on social media. So, yeah, you post the good stuff, um, but there's always issues going on. So mm. in terms of someone to help me with my mental side, I do have someone, I've, I've had the same coach since I was 10, um, mm. And I think it's extremely important to have someone on your side mentally because with a lot of sports, especially snooker, you're all over the place mentally a lot of the mm. time, mm. trying to find ways to improve, trying to understand how you're not getting anywhere or mm. so many different things that go on in your head. And it's a confusing place and you, your mind plays tricks on you, especially when you're involved and you're the one that it's happening to. Mm. It's very important to have somebody in your corner who can actually see it from an outsider's perspective and tell you that everything's okay or that there's nothing really wrong, um, or that just give it time, or whatever it might mm. be. Mm. Someone there to tell you it's not that bad, because it usually isn't that bad. Yeah. But it always feels like it's the end of the world, but it's usually not. So if you're on, if I was on my own, my head would be all over the place, because, mm. you know, a, a lot of the time, I do find myself in a, in a pond, you know, just thinking everything terrible. Mm. And if I was left to that, it would get worse and worse and worse to the point where I start playing left-handed because I think my right hand don't work no more. Yeah. Um, whereas having someone in my corner just to, to tell me to shut up, basically, mm -hmm. uh, and, and just, just listen to what he has to say. It's good mm -hmm. in a way. Like, I don't have to take responsibility for, for anything. He just says, you know, let me sort it. Mm -hmm. Just do what I say. Stop worrying. Everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And then I don't have to worry about what I'm doing because I'm putting it in someone else's hands. So all I just focus on doing is playing snooker. Mm. I don't have to worry about my head because it's like my head's been sorted out for me because mm. snooker players heads are usually terrible. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's really important to have someone to just either tell you if things going to be okay or just tell you to just not worry about it mm. because mm. in a tournament of 128 people, 127 of them have lost. So everyone's got a reason to, yeah, doubt or worry or complain or moan mm. and uh, sometimes those doubts and worries and complaints and moans can develop and then become genuine problems where you start doubting yourself or questioning mm. things mm. so yeah it's, it's important to have someone just to balance you out and sometimes tell you to shut up and stop thinking <laughs> and, and that and that's interesting isn't it you know there's something about i mean we're, again we get just talking about different players we've had on and how this has come up before uh, Gary Wilson came on and he was talking a bit about you know, there was that famous incident, wasn't there? Was it the Championship League where he kind of followed through and then played another mm -hmm. shot that he shouldn't have? And he, he kind of said that my head's gone and all of this. And he talked about how he'd had stress at home with house renovations, all sorts of things going on and how it was just really hard. And and I guess, as you say, you're kind of putting across a persona and the rapping, I guess, helps with that because in a sense, people are seeing you as larger than life because you're not only this sneaker player they're seeing, but also... You've got, you know, you're very good at what you do with that, you know. Um, we're all quite impressed with what we've seen, I think. Um, so so we've probably seen you in different dimensions in a way. Um, but as Lee might come on to, you're also 
you seem very sensitive and deep in a good way and in, in the sense that you feel it you feel it seems even just talking to you like you feel a lot um and that you know you're not afraid of talking about that albeit that you're protecting the brand and think about the the way you come across i mean lee you were interested in some of the stuff off table weren't you that um that peter's involved in yeah peter i know you're an ambassador for silence and suicide the the charity uh, would you like to tell us a wee bit more about that yeah so it's um it's a great charity they got in touch with me shortly before i turned pro so they were my lucky charm and um we were doing one of those uh, snooker charity challenges on Facebook where they were over lockdown when anyone who had access to a table was doing the charity, uh, doing a video live on Facebook, um, do a, a challenge, whether it be a lineup or a long blue or whatever it was, and uh, donating a bit of money and trying to beat a high score or whatever. So I, I got involved with one of the lineup challenges and um, knowing that it was going to be live on Facebook to few hundred people who were all tuning in it was like it was that only pleasure anyone had over lockdown was oh who's yeah. going to start switching walls live on facebook next <laughs> i was like all right bring me on um and so i thought it's either a chance for me to do a rap or be silly or you know just do what i normally do try to make people laugh and try to spread fun or a chance for me to actually show that i'm not all about that and i have got a serious side mm. so i thought well, let's just do the serious side business because you know no one's no one's everyone thinks i'm a joke so let's be serious for once <laughs> And um, so I just I gave a little speech about my thoughts on mental health in snooker. And I just touched upon how I wasn't even pro yet, but I was good mm. at I, I know I know how, how it is. And I'm good at putting putting myself in other people's positions. And I just mm. said, like, you know, you, you imagine you've gone to China, you're in a, a last 16 and you've got a match to get to the quarterfinal. And that match is worth 12 grand, you know, mm. in, increasing prize money. 12 grand it gets to a final black and you twitch it mm, mm. that's not on luck that's not on it that's on you you messed up you couldn't handle it you've put all them hours in but you still messed up you've now lost 12 grand you may have cost yourself a place on the circuit because of that mm. and now you've got to travel 25 26 hours home on a plane on your own yeah with all them thoughts in your head then you've got to go home to an empty club bang your head against the wall trying to practice to improve Mm. knowing not knowing whether you're ever, ever going to get to a last 16 again because it was so hard to get there in the first place and you got all that way and then you threw it away to get to the quarters mm. Mm. and now you're on your own again doing it all again like trying to improve and you go to tournaments to lose first round where'd you go it's it's mentally mm. horrible and so i just spoke about that and you know trying to put yourself in those positions it's really difficult mm. for some of the pros to be in and uh, i just i just spoke about that and i, I said you know uh, that always listen to your friends ask them if they're okay sometimes mm. you have to ask twice just really pay attention i mean especially over lockdown it was a horrible time mm. and um and so they they contacted me and said would you like to be an ambassador and i said well i don't know what that involves but I'll, mm. you know i'll try and help out best i can and then i thought well as is standard with me i might as well do you a song mm. um so we, I, I was working on a song um it's bloody long time now it's been going on i've got it written but there's been so many issues because of copyright you know i was talking about copyright before mm. about how my songs can't be or some of the, you know because i'm not writing my own music so i have to worry about copyright stuff mm. this one because it's a charity song intended to you know raise money we can't have copyrighted music so the backing track that i originally had which i found off youtube isn't going to wash mm. so mm. i've got the lyrics i've got the, the melody i think it's really good i think it's very powerful very graphic it's going to make people cry it's it's a painful song mm. and i think it's i think it really captures a lot of different aspects of suicide mm. uh, i'm very proud of it but we just need uh, someone to reproduce a backing track from, from scratch brand new mm. song and then it will become my own rather than being a parody yeah. um i think i've got someone that's taking a bit of time and then once i've got that i'll need a singer to just do the singing parts because my voice isn't quite up to it it's not too bad but it's not that great <laughs> either and it's not going to be enough to to be on something so important mm -hmm. and uh, and then if i get an actor to play a few, you know, a few actors to play parts in a video i'll get it produced and it, it will be it'll be obviously the best thing i've done mm -hmm. you know it's one thing making comedy songs but this will be the best thing i've produced yeah um and yeah so i i do want to get it done as soon as possible but it's not been easy but once that's done, it'll be it'll be out there and hopefully raise a lot of awareness, raise a bit of money for the charity. Mm. They've got a phone line where they're 
unlike the Samaritans who just listen to you, the volunteers on this phone line are, are able to give advice and actually be there and not just listen, but talk back and, and give opinions, which sometimes people need rather than just being listened to. Sometimes they need someone to say, what do I do? Mm. Um, so yeah, great charity run by some, some great people and uh, it's good to be part of it. It's good to, be, good to know that, especially with being a snooker player as well, knowing that, you know, it's, although it's not exactly the same as, you know, just a normal life, you know, you still go through your own issues, mm. uh, especially when you're on the losing end. Mm. Yeah, that, that, I mean, again, that's really interesting. And I think, um, you know, the, the, we were told, you know, the WST kind of has a, a post really involved in the well-being of the players on the tour. And, and, and I don't know whether that's something that you've had much to do with, but it just seems from what everybody says in, in terms of when we've met them and if we've gone down that route, that, you know, the mental side of the game is just so unbelievably brutal i mean even yesterday i know it's a different example but even yesterday john higgins gets a, a microphone under his his nose straight after losing to neil robertson and says i'm not sure i can cut it at this level anymore and you're yeah. thinking this is john higgins <laughs> um you know and clearly gutted and he's nearly beat he's nearly beat neil robertson yeah, so yeah exactly it's not like you can't cut if you can't you can say you can't cut it if you can't get close to a final but, you know. <laughs> yeah i mean he was obviously just gutted after two two successive uh, final defeats. But, you know, even if somebody like him can go away and maybe you know, feel gutted at it and, and go and reflect and feel bad, somebody of his st stature in the game, you think, well, it's just... Uh, and you mentioned the tennis earlier, you know, it's not a dynamic game where you're hitting something, they're hitting something. You you can't... Once you're sat down, yeah. you're just praying you're on, on your own. Yeah, you're just hoping that they're going to mess up or... or... And you, you, everything's going through your head on there. So, yeah, it's, it's horrible. Yeah. It's the worst place to be. Um players low down the rankings like me um you know it can be fixed we, we you know we don't need counseling we just need more money just give us money we'll yeah yeah just give us more money prize money for losing prize money for winning just give us money we'll be very happy yeah so more from world sneakers listening is give us money that's all i ask <laughs> <laughs> um it doesn't i mean it, it speaking about that it was a joke but you know um Having nothing for a first round loser is very harsh. Yeah. I'm sure many people have discussed this before. Me and Joe Perry have had a few conversations about this. Mm. Um, I'm sure people wouldn't care if it was 500 slash 2,000, 500 mm. or 1,000 slash 2,000. Covers yeah. costs. Yeah. yeah. It's helpful. Mm. Um, but no, not happening. But yeah, I think that would be useful. It's, 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 it's a weird position to be in to say that, you know, let's say number 113 in the world, mm. but I've only made three grand. Oh, yeah, yeah, weird position to be in, but I looked yeah, at tennis as uh, here's one for you. I'll ask you a question now <laughs> How many women's tennis players in the open era have earned more than a million in prize money? I mean, absolutely no idea. What about you, Lee? You got anything on that? I, as as I, alone, how many women's tennis players in the last 30 years or so have earned more than a million just in prize money? More than a million? Gee whiz. Um, I, I would say a lot because there's so much money in tennis. Do you, do you want a number? Yeah. Oh, jeez. Everyone else, everyone else watching this can start getting their tennis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. 200. Not bad, but 444. Right. Well, wow. Check. wow. Which, obviously, you've got the major events where you get millions just for winning it. But they're paid so well down the line as well. Mm. Mm. And even, you know, first round losers are getting paid. Yeah. Now, it's not my place to say that World Snooker needs to pay everyone because, you know, they've got money to pay. You know, they, they mm. haven't got endless supplies of money. You know, they, they're doing the best they can and they've given me a tour to play on. So I'm very grateful for it. You know, the opportunities I've had, mm. the money that can be made is great. But just that one thing of, you know, giving some money to people who are losing, at least covering expenses. Yeah, absolutely. You know, tennis yeah. players, albeit a stupidly much bigger sport, but forget you, in Wimbledon, you get 40 odd thousand just for turning up. Mm. So if that was, you know, condensed into the sort of money that snooker players are getting, even just 500 just for turning up. Yeah. You yeah. cover all your costs and um, 
put take a little bit of pressure off and if that 500 pound came off the second round prize money i'm sure mm. no one would really care losing 500 mm. i've won first round i've won two two and a half grand that's fine mm. better than it's three grand two and a half grand it's not much you, you wouldn't mind taking two and a half grand if the, if the loser gets 500 that's it's an idea but obviously barry's not interested in that which is fair enough but that would mm. that would help in terms of as we were saying players mental health mm. they're not having all or nothing all or nothing is not a good or healthy no um situation to be in same no. with gambling you know gambling is also bad for mental health especially when you're in a when yeah. you've got a problem everyone knows about the problems that gambling can do to mental health but that's an all or nothing business yeah yeah, yeah. And, and, and effectively you know we're in an all or nothing with the money you know mm. uh, if it was i think if, it, if, if there was a little bit of prize money paid to to the runners up to at least mm. cover costs i think that would certainly help a little bit only a tiny yeah. bit help a little bit and of course it puts a lot of pressure on your first round game because obviously if you lose that you're not getting paid uh and i, I think if you won your first game it would take so much pressure off your next match and it would it does, give you a chance yeah. to do what you can do. It does. That's what it, in the first season, that's exactly what it did. You know, I won the first game. You know, you've got money. Mm. Um, mm. You know, you go to the shopping center and buy KFC without having to worry. Mm. And then you go to your second game and you're, you're in the tournament. You feel like you've got a little bit of a weight off your shoulders. Mm. Yeah. That's why I was relaxed against playing Mark Williams. Whereas if it was a first round match, I'd be a lot more tense. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it makes a hell of a difference when you're playing, knowing that you've, you know, you've already got a little bit there. Yeah. Well, well, let, well, let's face it. I mean, I, I you know, we, we could really go into this one. And and I know a while ago, I think Barry Hearn was quoted as saying something about not rewarding mediocrity or something, which which he kind of knew what he was getting at. But it, it's also a really dismissive way of saying what I think he was trying to say. But you kind of look at it, don't you? And you think, well, this is, prof you know, you professional snooker players. I mean, what other jobs would you be OK with that kind of wage? And, and turn up for work and not know if you're going to get paid. I mean, and But also, it's also that thing around, you know, I was showing, my daughter's not really into snooker, and we went to the Wednesday of the English Open last week, watched Neil Robertson, Sonia Carney, and then Judd Trump as well. And I was showing her the rankings and, like, how transparent it is about earnings. You know, you don't normally get that in so many sports, see the actual earnings you're getting. Yeah. And she was like, wow, wow, as we were scrolling down. So, of course, at the top group, wow, that's what they're getting over the two-year period. Wow, look at that, look at that. And, of course, you're getting halfway down and you're starting to go, right, that's really changing now, isn't it? The picture's changing. And then you're getting yeah. towards the, the lower end and you're thinking, these guys can't make a living out of this. Th these guys cannot live off snooker. Um, no, there's a, I've, I've got a stat for you. I like my stats. Um, this, I don't know what it's like now, but this was true about six months ago, that in the main rankings the top five players in the world who I believe was Ronnie Trump Selby Robertson and Kyron not 100% sure but I think it was that at the time the top five players if you combined all their prize money so Ronnie was on a million and a bit Selby was on a million and a bit mm. combined all the top five prize money in the top five players was more than every single one of the 123 others combined mm. So five players have got more money than 123 of the others. Yeah. Now, yeah, they were dominating. Obviously, they were the five best players, but that shows how top heavy it is. Mm -hmm. Very top heavy. And uh, that is, I mean, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, five out of 128 have got more money than the other 123 in in a two year in a mm -hmm. two year list. So it's very very top heavy. You know, things like Gibraltar Open. Six thousand pound for a semi final, fifty thousand for the final. Mm. In what in what world is getting to a semi final more than eight times less than a final? Mm. Yeah. Well, even even in, in the, the world championship, obviously the semis is a hundred and the winner is fifty. Mm. In the UK championship, the semis is forty and the winner is two hundred. So that's a fifth of the winner, mm. which is still. I don't think right. I think I think you know if, if the winner's going to get uh, something, then the runner-up should get a little bit more than fifty percent of what the winner gets. Mm -hmm. So if the world championship was five hundred, the runner-up should get three hundred, and then mm -hmm. the semi should get one fifty. Mm -hmm. That's that's how it would work. I, I, I've got I've got a system that I would use to do with statistics and algorithms mm -hmm. and maths, mm -hmm. but it would be that 
uh, that system. So, you know, if you've got, if it's 100 for the winner, it's 75 for the runner up, mm. Mm. then 50 for the semis, and then 35, and then 25, you know, in a, in a percentage base, mm. not six for the semis and then 50 for the winner. That's just bizarre. Yeah. I get it. They want to make it look attractive that the winner gets a lot of money, which mm. is fine. But by doing that, they're taking money off all the lower, all the, all the, all the earlier stages. Mm. Mm. And it is, it's ridiculously top heavy. And then you've got the UK championships, which is six and a half for the first round. Mm. Whereas you'd have to get to like, I got to the last 16 of the European masters and I got six, yeah. which I thought brilliant. That's amazing. Yeah. Mm. Mm. but then a, a few tournaments later in the UK championship 64 players out of 128 have got six and a half mm. so that's six that I've grafted for 64 people have overtook me already yeah, yeah. and suddenly yeah, I've gone from being really high in the I was like 15th in the one year list mm. because I was in the top 16 of that suddenly yeah. I've gone to like 80th because 64 players have jumped up yeah so mm. it's very it's very top heavy it's very uncorrelative mm. and there's mm. no consistency in it but yeah, obviously it is the way it is. I can't change it, but um, it certainly could do with some some work. And I, I've got a system that would work, I think. Or not so much with money, but at least with ranking points, mm. it would work. Um, and, and it's to do with percentages, and you know, every tournament having the same breakdown of percentages, although different money and different amounts of points for different prestige, mm. but mm. the same percentage breakdown. So that if you did well in one tournament. And then someone else did well in a tournament of the same sort of prestige. You'd mm. get the same amount of points. Not suddenly, yeah. not getting to a semi-final of a home nation event and winning twenty thousand, or getting to the semi-final of Gibraltar, which is almost exactly the same, and, yeah. winning, 20, and winning six thousand. Yeah, don't yeah. work. Don't work. So, and and touching upon that, you know, my tour survival for this season to stay on the circuit to put, it literally is all about the UK championship mm. unless I have a semi-final or a final in one of the in one of the other events like the Welsh Open or the Gibraltar well forget Gibraltar I've got to win Gibraltar Welsh mm. Open something like Turkish Masters if I get to a semi or a final or maybe a quarter mm. that might be enough to stay on the tour but winning two matches in the UK might be enough do you know what I mean it's yeah. it's yeah. um it's I'm trying not to put any, I'm not putting any pressure on myself now. Whatever happens, happens. Mm. If I fall off, I fall off. I'll have experience. Hopefully, I get back on. Mm. We'll, go, we'll play it by ear from there, you know. But I'm expecting to fall off purely because there's just not enough events left for me to mm. catch up. Um, I don't think I've done too bad. I've had some good wins. I've, I've performed well. Mm. Um, I've had a better start than I thought I would. I'm quite happy with it. It's not been amazing. It's been okay. Mm. But obviously, okay isn't going to be enough to stay on the tour. You have to do well in the majors. There's plenty yeah. of people above me in the rankings who have won less matches than I have, mm. but they've mm. done it in the UK, which is probably worth about, well, winning one match in the UK is the equivalent of winning three matches anywhere else. Yeah. So uh, it's just about doing it. All the, all the worlds as well, Five thousand. some people are winning 10,000 for one match in, yeah. the world mm. in terms of ranking points. Um, so, yeah, it's all about the UK and the worlds. I could literally not even turn up for the other events on the calendar. And if I do well in the UK and the world this season, mm. uh, I'll be okay. I think with China on the calendar, it's different because then there's a lot more major events. Mm. But uh, as it stands this season, I could have a good run in the World Championship and stay on or get yeah. to the Crucible and stay on. But um, all you know, the, the, the shootout, the Welsh Open, the Turkish Masters, mm. unless I get to a semi-final or more, it's making no difference whatsoever because the mm. gap between where I am in 80th and the target of top 64 mm. it might only be 16 places, but there's like 40,000 gap between that. Yeah. yeah. And you ain't going to win 40,000 pound in the Welsh Open or Turkish Masters unless oh. you win the whole tournament. Mm. You can get to a quarterfinal, great, 10 grand, not going to cut it. No. So a quarterfinal of a ranking event, just not going to cut it. So, um, yeah, basically all about the UK, got to do well in the UK and got to do in the world's which is putting major pressure on it. So that's why yeah. I'm trying to just completely mm. not bother about it and just turn up and see, try and try my best. Yeah. Um, but that is the, the nature of the tour at the moment. It's just about the two major events mm. Mm. and everything else, unless you have a stupidly deep run, is basically just pointless. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But useful anyway, great. But, you know, it, it's not going to do any damage from 80th upwards. Mm. Up to get me up to eighty, it's done. It's been fine. You know, every every match I've won, I've been slowly climbing. climbing. Yeah, 
Mm -hmm. But now it's got to a stage where every match I win is making no difference whatsoever. Yeah. Like, if I beat that I renew in the last tournament, I wouldn't even have moved up one place. Mm. Wow. Um, so you really need that run. You, it's, so it's, it's such a big tournament for you, the UK. Yeah, consistency is absolutely not necessary to stay on the... Mm. Up, up at the top, it, it might be, but to stay up... For someone low down in the rankings to stay on the tour, mm. consistency is the opposite of what you need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it sounds stupid, but it really is. All you need is one good tournament. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And consistency is, is the last thing you need. You know, you'd rather. Jordan Brown's had a, an amazing run, wins the Welsh Open. He doesn't have to win a match for two years now. Yeah. yeah. He's, going to be in, he's going to be in the top 32 or top, six, top 64, guaranteed for two years mm. without having to win a single match. So we'd all love to be in that position. But, you yeah. know, if he'd, if he'd won, if he'd got to a, a round three, around four, around two, around three again, around three again, he'd be off. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's just all about a really deep run in one event. And that's what I'm holding out for, basically, that it, it can happen. I know I'm capable. I know I can do that. It just has to happen. Because mm -hmm. winning a few matches here and there and being consistently good at you know winning three matches in each event isn't going to be enough. Mm -hmm. So... So, so I get the sense, Peter. I mean, we need. We, this is part one for me because, to be honest, we haven't touched upon a lot of the things I'd really like us to talk to to with you about. And I think you're you're really taking us into an interesting place about kind of the equality of tournaments and the money and the way it's divided and the issue, and therefore the issue on a mental health for players, but b the supply line of players improving to almost get to the level where you know they're able to compete for the top stuff. Uh,